I think again of a statement Dr. Tosa made to me once. He said, Len, you know what? He said, we'll hardly get our feet out of time into eternity and gaze on eternity before we bow our heads in shame and humiliation and say, my God, look at all the riches there were in Jesus Christ. And I've come to the judgment seat almost a pauper. I think before we point the finger at the world, we better turn to the church and say, look, we better all get sackcloth and ashes and humble ourselves and say, Almighty God, when I see the church in the New Testament, they didn't have stately buildings. They didn't have paid evangelists. They didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have organization. They didn't, couldn't get on TV and beg. But I'll tell you what they did. They turned the world upside down. You'll discover this. The men who have been most heroic for God have been the men with the greatest devotional life. Oh, well, how do you handle this? How do you handle this? You know why the world is poor and sick outside? Because we really don't know how to pray, that's why. Let me live with a man a while and share his prayer life and I'll, I'll tell you how tall I think he is or how majestic I think he is in God. Well, let's, pre let's preview eternity. Here we are, millions of people, all the prayer warriors. America has produced some of the greatest. Praying Payson of Portland had a, had a floor harder than that. And at the side of his bed, when he, he knelt, he used to pray and pray and pray. And when they washed his body for burial, he had great big hoofs on his knees like camels, like history says that James in the Bible had camel's knees. At least tradition says that. Well, it's a living fact that Payson had them. And when they were washing him, somebody said, well, what, what abnormal knees, they're callous, they're heavy with calluses. Yeah, because he used to pray at the side of his bed with energy. And in that hard floor, he wore two grooves like that, about six or seven inches long, where he used to pray and make intercession. Praying patient, of course. John Hyde. I met somebody who used to hear him pray and told me what an amazing thing it was to hear him pray in India. But the greatest ministry, I'm sure, is the ministry of intercession. Let's look at all the apostles and all the saints of all the ages. There's Finney, look, there's Finney the, uh, with his amazing revival. There's William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. Uh, there's John Wesley. David Brainard, uh, uh, just a young American, died at the age of 28. And he followed the Indians and he had tuberculosis. And he says, I got up this morning and the Indians were still committing adultery there and still drinking there and still beating their tom-toms and still shouting like hell itself. He came out of the teepee, he was sharing, and he said there was nowhere to pray. So I went out in the forest. And he said, I knelt and the snow was up to my chin. And it was a half hour after sunrise. He weighed about 95 pounds. No, he didn't have a heater with him or anything else. He, he was just there in the frigid snow, half an hour after sunrise. And he said, I did so wrestle in prayer, he says in his archaic, uh, archaic English. I wrestled in prayer for, for about 12 hours. The sun was setting. And, and then I could only touch the snow with the tips of my fingers. He, he, the snow was up to his chin when he started praying. And he, and he makes intercession of little body that weighed 90 pounds until the sweat of his body melted the snow. Praying patient of Portland, John Hyde, the great intercessor, David Brainer. When God opens that book of intercession, when he puts the fire to their prayer life, their devotional life, I'll tell you what, there'll be nothing lost. It won't be wood, it won't be hay, it won't be stubble. We won't all be the same in heaven. There'll be great distinctions in heaven. You can't think that the dying thief, he'll be in heaven all right, because he said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And, and sure enough, God will do that. Jesus said he would, but he'd wasted his life. Take just one character, John Wesley. He was saved soundly when he was 35 years of age. Turn 35 round, it makes 53. Put 53 and 35 together, makes 88. The time he died in 1891. Yeah, Wesley made an awful lot of money. Do you know what he did with it? He built orphanages, he built churches, he printed Bibles, he printed hymn books. There was no time wasted in his life. He was methodical, systematic. He went to dinner with the greatest man in English literature and the man said, now, you finished dinner, let's you fold our legs under the table, he said. Or, you know, cross your legs under the table and, and let's uh, just have a nice time of conversation. And Wesley said, I'm sorry, I have to go. Oh, but it is not yet nine o'clock. No, it's not. Well, why are you going? He said, I have an appointment in the morning at four o'clock. At four o'clock? Tomorrow morning? Every morning of my life, he said. With who? With God. He disciplined his life. He disciplined his body in eating. He disciplined his hand in his pocket. We shall stand at the judgment seat of Christ. An awesome prospect for any of us. You know, if we can't live as a different breed of people on this earth, we have no right to live here. We shouldn't be affected by changing customs or changing styles or changing opinions or whether the stock market goes up or down or whether the clouds are gathering for... That, that doesn't make any odds. We ought to live every day as though we come out of another world into this world with the power of that world upon us. 
to live and speak and move and have our being in Jesus Christ.